The city of Tyler in Texas is named after John Tyler, the 10th president of the United States. The largest city in Smith County, its economy started mainly through agriculture and fruit, especially peaches, became the principal crop in the county in 1900. In the early 20th century, disease hit the peach trees and decimated the industry. Farmers began growing roses, which proved to be perfect for the local climate. By the 1940s, half of the U.S. rose supply came from farms within a 10-mile radius of Tyler. Of course, the discovery of oil nearby in 1930 also gave the city a massive boom. Kim Cargill spent most of her life fighting viciously with her ex-husbands and the fathers of her children. When she became the focus of a contentious court battle, she knew that her babysitter's testimony would be detrimental to her case. She had to stop her from testifying. This is Monsters. Kim Cargill was born on November 30, 1966, in Mississippi. Shortly after her birth, her father joined the military and her mother, Rachel, began seeing his best friend. This led to the couple divorcing shortly after he returned from training. Some of Kim's earliest experiences were of the custody battle between her parents. When Rachel offered her soon-to-be ex-husband no child support if he signed over his rights to Kim, he accepted and fell out of touch with his daughter. As soon as the divorce was final, Rachel married her ex-husband's former best friend, and he formally adopted Kim. When Kim was three years old, her mother and father had a daughter together, named April. Kim's youth was filled with fights between her and her mother. Kim claimed that Rachel was physically abusive, and some of Kim's friends did say they remembered fights, and one friend said she heard what sounded like Rachel choking Kim in the next room. When Kim was 12 years old, the family moved to Richardson, Texas, just outside of Dallas. Not long after the move, Kim was rushed to the emergency room and diagnosed with meningitis. She was given a spinal tap and spent weeks in the hospital. In high school, Kim was considered well-liked and social. She couldn't get the feeling that she was always out of place in her family out of her head, so not long before she graduated high school, she went to Mississippi to meet her biological father. She always hated that nobody ever told her about her real father until she asked. She also couldn't figure out why he never contacted her after the divorce. It made her unable to get close to him, and she ended up returning to Texas sooner than she had planned. Once she completed high school, Kim began taking classes at the community college. She was studying to become a nurse and was taking the prerequisite classes. She started slacking off and skipping classes, eventually quitting school and taking a job as a secretary at a law firm. It was there that she met a man named Mike West. He was the son of one of the firm's clients, and the couple quickly started dating. After a short courtship, the couple flew to Hawaii and got married in June of 1988. The relationship was not healthy. They both admitted that when they got angry, they got physical. The police were called once because Mike had thrown Kim into a wall, leaving a body-shaped impression in the drywall. Mike wasn't charged because he had only done that because Kim had thrown a can of hairspray at him, cutting his head open. After a couple years of violence, Kim tried to fix the marriage by having a baby. Newsflash, having a baby will never fix your relationship. It may distract you from it, but it won't fix any of the problems. David was born in 1990, and in some respects, it did seem as though Kim was doing better. Friends said she seemed happier, but Mike was seeing the opposite. Kim's temper became even worse, and one time, after an argument, she got into the car and drove it into his workbench, which happened to be inside the garage, attached to the house. Mike said that the wall shifted three or four inches. Mike and Kim went to a psychiatrist, and doctors were concerned with her behavior enough to admit her to a psychiatric facility. She was eventually released with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. She was unable to get along with anyone, and if she didn't get her way, she would explode. Psychiatrists were concerned for the welfare of her son. A lengthy battle between the parents started to determine who was more fit to take care of David. After meeting with psychiatrists and having in-person evaluations of their parenting, doctors recommended that Mike be given sole guardianship of their son. One doctor wrote, quote, 
His psychological profile suggests he has the capacity to meet his son's needs, and that his capacity to do so is significantly greater than Kimberly West's. End quote. The court followed the recommendation, and Mike was granted sole custody of David. Kimberly sank into a depression and began believing that everyone was out to get her. She continued to fight with Mike regarding her visitation. Mike had found out that Kim had hit David with a hairbrush and choked him during one visit. This resulted in her being required to have supervised visitations, which she had to pay the court costs of. This made her see David less and less. By this time, Mike had moved on and remarried a woman named Sonia, and Kim was seeing a man named Brian Cargill. They got married in 1994 when they found out that she was pregnant. Brian said they weren't planning to get married until she got pregnant. She gave birth to another son, we'll call him Josh, in November of 1994. It didn't take long for Brian to meet Kim's violent side, and the marriage only lasted a year. He filed for divorce, which was finalized in December of 1995, and the two shared custody of their son. Kim was a manipulative person. After Mike and Sonia got married, Kim befriended Sonia's ex-husband, and the two became close. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer, I guess. One day, after Kim had been released from having supervised visits with David, Sonia's ex asked her if she could also pick up his daughter when she went to the West home to pick up David. When she arrived at the house, Sonia agreed to let her pick up the girl for her ex-husband. While Sonia was saying goodbye to her daughter, Kim got impatient and yanked the girl by the arm. She was literally carrying the young girl by her arm, with her feet off the ground. Sonia grabbed the girl, but as she did, Kim turned around and kicked the woman in the stomach. She then pushed her against a wall and began beating her. David got out of his mother's car and tried to stop the attack, but he knew he was no match for the angry woman. He ended up running to the end of the driveway, not knowing what else to do. When Kim was done assaulting Sonia, she told David to get in the car. When he refused, she picked him up, threw him over her shoulder, and then threw him through the window into the backseat of the car. She took off as someone in the West home was calling the police. One of David's shoes was left behind in the driveway. Kim was pulled over and arrested on outstanding warrants for traffic violations and unpaid tickets. See, this is why you gotta make sure you don't have outstanding warrants. Police don't need any reason to bring you in. They could just arrest you based on outstanding warrants. You're just making their jobs easier. While being booked for her warrants, she was questioned about the attack on Sonia. After Kim told them, quote, if I ever find that woman in a dark alley, I'm going to twist her head off, end quote, the officers had heard enough and read Kim her rights. Eventually, she posted bond and then she went back into the station to tell the two officers that had arrested her that she was going to sue everybody there. She claimed that they refused her medical care for the few superficial injuries she had even though they asked her multiple times if she wanted medical attention and then had her sign a release when she refused. Yeah, she was one of those people. Because of the attack, David didn't feel safe with his mother. He talked to his father and told him he didn't want to see her anymore. He told her that during a meeting with Family Services, and that was the last time he ever saw her. Kim finally completed her nursing school and became a licensed vocational nurse, called a licensed practical nurse in some states. While in school, one of the other nursing students introduced Kim to her brother, Matt Robinson. The two started dating, and Matt moved in with Kim. He quickly realized what he had gotten himself into and said he would have moved out sooner, but he wanted to try to protect her younger son, Josh. He had seen her hit and choke the boy. Once, while they were fighting in the car, while it was parked, Kim had Josh on her lap and the passenger door was open. In a fit of rage, she threw Josh out of the door onto the concrete sidewalk. Matt didn't want to leave Josh alone with Kim. He knew she was abusing him, but he couldn't continue in the relationship. After eight months, at least six months longer than he wanted to stay, he finally packed up and left. Three weeks later, Kim called him and told him she was pregnant. Of course, he didn't believe her. When they got together, she told him that she couldn't get pregnant, and he assumed she was just telling him she was pregnant to stir things up. Unfortunately, it was actually worse. Kim lied about not being able to get pregnant, so she could ultimately get Matt to put his guard down in their sex life. Then, she would be able to trap him with a child, linking them together through a shared child for the next 18 years. Kim had her third son in 1999. 
We'll call him Chris. Matt refused to be in the child's life until a paternity test proved he was in fact the father. As the years passed by, Matt lived in constant fear that Chris would be seriously hurt while with Kim. The boy was once found wandering the street at night in only a diaper. Matt eventually believed that he needed to take desperate measures, and when he picked up his son for a visit, he just didn't bring him back. Then he tried to take Kim to court over custody. Let me give you some advice. If you want full custody of your child, don't essentially kidnap them first. Speaking from the United States, and laws vary from state to state, but generally, yes, you can kidnap your own child. If you have a court-appointed custody schedule and you take the child outside of those times, it is kidnapping. And it seems as though a kidnapping charge is not a good look when you're trying to argue that the other parent is a danger to the child. Kim had Matt arrested for kidnapping, and though he was able to have the charges dropped, the court wouldn't give him custody of Chris. Matt continued to monitor his son's life under the volatile care of Kim as best as he could and wait until he had an opportunity to get custody. It wasn't long before Kim had moved on to a new man. She met Forrest Garner, a single father of a five-year-old, we'll call him Sam, at a pool hall in 2004. Kim masked her violence much longer than she had with other men. Maybe it was because they didn't live together, but after they got married on April 30th, 2005, he said she started to change. She lied about her family, telling him that her mother and her first son David were both dead. She also assured Forrest that she couldn't get pregnant. Then, of course, she announced that she was pregnant. She had successfully caught another man in her web. The pregnancy kept Forrest in the relationship even when she did things that should have made him leave. Once on a trip for her to get an amniocentesis, she got upset at something he said and threw hot coffee in his face. He cleaned himself up and took her to her appointment. Kim gave birth to her fourth son in November of 2005. We'll call him Jacob. It wasn't long after the birth that the relationship ended. One day, Forrest had the day off from work, so when the older boys got home from school, he made them something to eat, which included some potato chips. Kim had been out of the apartment, but when she came home, she saw Josh eating chips and yelled at him about it. When Forrest came into the kitchen and told Kim that he had said it was okay, Kim flipped out and started punching her husband. She was throwing hard punches to his face and chest. When Forrest's son, Sam, got between them and told her to stop, Kim hauled off and punched the little boy right in the face and knocked him across the living room. He was five years old. Now, it seems as though Forrest had the same thought that many of us fathers would have, and that was, oh, hell no. He picked Kim up and threw her into the fireplace. Then he picked up Sam and left the apartment. He called his mother, who in turn called the police. Kim had fled the apartment before they got there, but Forrest filed a report. Sam's whole face was so swollen that his eyes were almost completely shut. Kim had succeeded in getting Forrest arrested before. She would pick a fight, start throwing things, and as soon as he did anything to defend himself, she'd call the police and report him. She was always the aggressor, and she always turned it around to make it look like she was the victim. This time, though, she had assaulted a child. She couldn't flip this. Forrest took Sam and moved into his mother's house. Kim called repeatedly, but he refused to talk to her. So Kim decided to fight dirty. Dirtier than she already did? Oh yeah, she got dirty. And I mean filthy. Kim called Forrest's ex-wife and told her that he was an alcoholic and a drug addict. She made it seem like Sam was in such danger that the ex-wife was able to get an emergency court order for full custody and take their son away from Forrest. Then Kim started leaving messages for Forrest that said, quote, If you do what I say and not press charges against me hitting Sam in the face, I'll get the boy back for you. End quote. Forrest didn't bite, though. He got a lawyer, he got a drug test, which came back clean, and he was able to convince his ex-wife that Kim was a sociopath. Then, he was able to sweet-talk Kim into going to his lawyer's office and signing an affidavit that said she lied about Forrest being an alcoholic and drug addict. He got Sam back, but he knew that he could not allow him to be around Kim. He took a page out of Matt's book and began monitoring Jacob from afar. He knew that there would eventually come a time that was right to get custody away from Kim. Unfortunately, the police wouldn't press charges against Kim for assaulting Sam. 
Forrest wanted to remain close enough to keep an eye on Jacob, and he and Sam eventually moved into an apartment complex called The Citadel in Tyler, Texas. It wasn't far from where Kim lived, and since she had refused to give him back his belongings, he had to agree to let her come over from time to time. She would come and bring a few pieces of clothing, and over time, he would get all of his stuff. This was at the expense of seeing Kim, who was usually angry and violent. He had thought about just going and picking all of his stuff up when she wasn't home, but she had actually told him if she found out he did that, she would light his mother's house on fire with her and Jacob inside. She was crazy, and he knew it, so he compromised. In 2006, Matt was beginning the process of getting full custody of his son. He took pictures every time Chris came back from Kim's house with marks on his body. Then, her second husband, Brian, began doing the same thing. Brian petitioned for sole custody of Josh and included pictures of bruises and even a bite mark that Kim had left on his arm. When Kim learned that the court was most likely going to side with Brian, she started calling Josh's friends, having them call him and tell him they missed him. She used his own friends in order to manipulate him into wanting to live with her. Eventually, the court gave full custody to Brian, but Kim had court-ordered visitation. Brian couldn't deny her ability to see her son, except when he was there, she took her anger with Brian out on him. She left him alone in the house and would take off for hours at a time. She would physically abuse him. She would yell at him and call him names. During one visit, she choked Josh, and when he got away from her, he ran from the house and called Brian. Brian called the police, and when they arrived at Kim's house, she claimed that Josh attacked her and Chris, and she wanted to press charges. The police could tell she was full of shit, so they took Josh to the police station where Brian picked him up. When Brian got there, there were visible bruises around Josh's neck. The boy was absolutely scared of his own mother. He was afraid that she was going to kill him, and he begged not to go to her house, but the court required it. Kim's behavior understandably caused issues with Josh's behavior, leading to fights between him and his father. When the courts learned about this, they returned full custody back to Kim. Fantastic job, courts. Josh did not want to live with his mother, so he began running away from home. One time, Brian found him hiding behind a lumber store in nothing but his underwear. He was covered in scratches from running through the woods. Josh believed that being outside in the cold in only his underwear was a better option than living with his mother. Eventually, Josh just stopped staying with Kim. By 2010, Kim had lost her two oldest sons. Matt was working on getting custody of his son, and Forrest had begun the process of getting custody of Jacob. Cherry Walker was a 39-year-old with a developmental disability. She had lived with her father, Jethry, and her stepmother, Ruan, her whole life. They had been discussing the possibility of Cherry moving out on her own for months. Jethry and Ruan believed that she was ready to move into adulthood, but they knew she would still need help. At 24 years old, Cherry had been tested at an IQ of 60, which is significantly lower than average. Her psychologist put her equivalent age at 5 or 6 at the time. In the last 15 years, Cherry had developed enough skills to be able to care for herself and her parents were willing to give it a shot. Jethry and Ruan helped Cherry find a studio apartment in Tyler at an apartment complex called The Citadel. The Behavioral Health Center in town helped people with developmental disabilities integrate into society. They assigned a caregiver, Paula Wheeler, to help her complete daily tasks and grow into her independence. The move was a huge success. Cherry was able to complete daily chores. She walked down the street to the laundromat to do her laundry. She walked to nearby restaurants like Papa John's and Church's Chicken. She eventually built the courage to walk further down the street to the Dollar General. She loved cleaning supplies and air fresheners and always had a full stock at her little apartment, which she kept spotless. Another resident of the Citadel Apartments was a woman named Marcy Fulton. She became friends with Cherry and she would regularly give the woman rides to the store to get groceries or rent movies. Cherry loved horror movies, the scarier the better. Marcy also babysat a four-year-old boy named Jacob. Jacob's mother would drop him off a few times a week, and there were times where she wouldn't return to pick him up for days. The mother was an aggressively rude woman named Kim. Marcy had grown tired of Kim's behavior and suggested she have Cherry babysit Jacob. 
Kim knew that Cherry was disabled, but the thought that she might not be capable of properly caring for a four-year-old either didn't occur to her, or most likely, she just didn't care. She began dropping Jacob off at Cherry's apartment all the time, still sometimes for days at a time without ever calling to check on her son. When Paula learned that Cherry was babysitting Jacob, she wasn't quite comfortable with it. She wasn't actually allowed to stop her since Cherry was an adult living on her own. Paula thought if Kim felt comfortable with it, then it was on her. Paula said she would show up to Cherry's apartment and see her there playing with Jacob. Cherry said that she didn't think Kim took very good care of the boy. Kim never left any supplies when she dropped him off with Cherry, she just dumped him and left. Cherry would feed him and buy him things. She would give him baths and clean his clothes because she said they were always ripped and dirty. This all seemed to be happening one floor beneath Forrest without him ever knowing at first, but eventually he found out. It's not clear how, but Paula's supervisor, Pertina Young, who was also her sister, had actually talked to Kim on the phone about having Cherry babysit Jacob. Kim didn't seem to understand that it was a problem, so Pertina threatened to report her to the Department of Family and Protective Services. Then Kim threatened that she knew someone in the DA's office, which she absolutely didn't. Pertina made it clear that she wasn't afraid of her threats and hung up. She most likely reported the incident to DFPS, and they eventually notified Forrest. Forrest was knee-deep in his court case to get custody of Jacob, and on June 18, 2010, Cherry got a subpoena to testify against Kim. At 10.18 a.m., a police officer approached Cherry and Paula in a parking lot and handed over the subpoena. Paula had to read it to her and explain what a subpoena was. The caregiver had to explain to her that she had to show up for court or else she could get a fine and go to jail. Cherry wasn't sure about going to court. She had another appointment at the time she was scheduled to be in court and didn't want to cancel it. She called Kim, who proceeded to tell her that she didn't have to go. Paula got on the phone with Kim, who tried to convince her that they just wanted to make Cherry look bad. She tried to make it seem as though she was just looking out for Cherry's well-being, but Kim was the only person that Kim ever wanted to protect. She knew that leaving her son with a developmentally disabled woman was not a good look in court, not to mention that Cherry could tell the court what condition Jacob was usually in when he arrived at her apartment. Kim tried to tell Paula that Cherry didn't have to testify, but the caregiver knew better. Then Kim suggested that they hide Cherry at her house until the court case was over. Paula was not about to commit a crime for Kim. Paula got off the phone with Kim and told Cherry again that she had to go or else she'd be held in contempt of court, which is a crime. Then Kim called Cherry's phone again and told Paula not to let Cherry tell anyone about the subpoena, that her and Cherry would figure it out together. Paula told Kim that she had to tell her supervisor about it because it was policy and she would also have to include it in her day's notes. Of course, Kim just yelled and insulted Paula, telling her that if she was a real friend to Cherry, she wouldn't make her go to the court date. After the call with Kim, Cherry was a nervous wreck. Paula took her to her office where they made a photocopy of the subpoena and called the court to iron out some details. Paula and Pertina were able to calm Cherry down. Then Paula dropped her off at an appointment she had at a hair salon. Cherry loved getting her hair done and these appointments were always her favorite. Jethry picked her up from the salon when she was done and dropped her off at her apartment. She called and checked in with Paula when she was home at about 4 p.m. and it seemed like she had calmed down and was her old happy self. Sometime after that, Kim called Cherry and told her she was going to pick her up and take her to dinner. Cherry had already eaten and didn't want to go with Kim, but she didn't know how to stop the headstrong woman from doing what she wanted. Kim also told Cherry that she would pay her a bunch of money to clean her house. Cherry called Paula at about 8 p.m. and told her about the call from Kim. Paula encouraged her to just go to bed and not answer the door when Kim got there, but it seemed that Cherry wasn't capable of keeping Kim at bay. Eventually, Kim did arrive at her apartment and Cherry did leave with her. It's unclear what happened that night. Kim took Cherry somewhere and most likely strangled her. Then she took Cherry's body out to a secluded area off County Road 2191 in White House and lit her on fire. On June 19th, a young man was driving down the same county road to pick up a co-worker when he noticed something on the side of the road. The man got out of his truck and walked toward the spot of charred earth, but when he got about 15 feet away from the spot, he could clearly see a body. He dialed 911 and waited in his vehicle for police to arrive. When police searched the scene, they noticed that the bottom of the victim's shoes were clean, 
meaning she couldn't have walked to that spot. The red clay dirt there would have been on the bottom of her shoes. Laying between her legs was a drinking straw, a wrapper from Chick-fil-A, and a dairy fresh coffee creamer cup. They didn't have an identification for the body. The medical examiner would later find petechial hemorrhaging in Cherry's eyes and eyelids, which was commonly found in strangulation victims. It wasn't 100%, but the ME also noted that the perpetrator had poured accelerant on the victim's neck, causing it to burn more severely than the rest of the body, making an examination of that area impossible. Why would they do that if they weren't covering something up? The same day, Jethri and Ruan hadn't heard from Cherry all day and they were a little worried, but they were trying to give her her space since she had moved out on her own. She could sometimes be forgetful, so they brushed it off and went about their day. The next day, Sunday, which was also Father's Day, Ruan grew even more concerned when they still hadn't heard from Cherry. She would always call before church. Cherry's brother drove the church van, and Ruan assumed he had picked her up, so she and Jethri headed to the Greater Love Temple Church in Tyler. Cherry had her own seat in the front pew that even had her name on it. When Ruan saw it empty, she looked for Cherry's brother and asked where his sister was. He didn't know. He had assumed she was with them. They called Cherry's cell phone and got no answer. After church, they went home, grabbed a spare key to Cherry's apartment, and went to check on her. When they went inside, they said the place was a mess for Cherry's standards. For someone who kept her place meticulously clean, seeing things laying around out of place and seeing her bed unmade was a huge red flag. The fact that they didn't find Cherry's cell phone or coin purse kept their spirits high since their daughter would never leave without those two things. It indicated that she probably left of her own free will. They had been pushing Cherry to be more independent and maybe that's what she was doing. They locked up her apartment and went back home, hoping she would call them soon. Later that day, still not having heard from Cherry, Ruan turned on the evening news while she considered what her next move was. When the news began talking about the body of a young woman that was found on the side of the road in White House, Ruan had a sinking feeling that it might be Cherry. Jethri was already asleep, so she wrote down the number they displayed on the screen and told herself she would call in the morning if she hadn't heard from Cherry by then. The following morning, when the news reported the story again, this time with a more detailed description, Ruan knew that it was her stepdaughter. She talked to Jethri about it and they called the Smith County Sheriff's Department to report their daughter was missing and matched the description that they heard on the news. The Walkers talked to Detective James Riggle, who was the lead investigator on the case. They gave him keys to Cherry's apartment and released medical and dental records so a positive ID could be made, which it was. The burned body discovered on the side of the road was confirmed to be 39-year-old Cherry Walker. Soon after talking to the Walkers, Detective Riggle called Paula. She told him all about Cherry and what her life was like. It was when she mentioned a subpoena that the detective had to stop and have her explain. Paula told him about the subpoena to testify against Kim Cargill and that Kim was trying to get her to not show up to court. Now investigators had a new lead and it put Kim at the top of their suspect list. Before talking to Kim, though, detectives wanted to get more information about her. They learned that on May 20th, Kim had picked Jacob up from daycare against the custody schedule that she had and then dropped him off with Cherry. She was essentially hiding Jacob at Cherry's apartment. Of course, Cherry didn't know that was going on. They also went to the medical staffing agency that Kim worked for and got her past work schedules. They learned that on Friday, June 18th, Kim had worked at a hospital in Athens from 7 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Except when they got surveillance footage from the hospital, it turned out that Kim actually left at 7.08 p.m. The hospital was about 45 minutes away from Cherry's apartment. If she left work at 7.08 and went straight to Cherry's apartment, it would fit the timeline based on the phone calls that Paula got from Cherry that night. One of the employees at the staffing agency remembered that after Kim left the hospital that night, they tried to get a hold of her because someone at the hospital wanted to verify whether or not she had given a patient an antibiotic that day, but they couldn't get a hold of Kim. The woman said that that was the first time she had ever called Kim and not had her either answer the phone or call her right back. She explained that company protocol was to call a nurse repeatedly until they got an answer if there was an issue with a patient. She said she called Kim over and over again until midnight and never got a response, which was unusual for her. 
Kim finally called back at 12.33 a.m. and said she had been sleeping. Detectives arrived at Kim's house on June 22nd without a warrant. They planned to knock on the door and ask if she would answer some questions and if they could have a look around. They were hoping she was interested in finding out who killed her babysitter and would give them permission to take a look around. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, that absolutely did not happen. As soon as they asked, Kim said she had to talk to her lawyer first. While working on a warrant to search Kim's house, detectives discovered that the court date that Cherry was going to testify at wasn't just about custody. It was to terminate Kim's parental rights to Jacob. If she lost, not only would she lose her son, but she would be brought up on charges of child neglect. Kim had a lot more to lose than they originally thought, and now it became even more likely that she had killed Cherry to keep her silent. When investigators returned to Kim's house with a warrant, she was not pleased, but there was nothing she could do about it. Detectives described her house as being utterly filthy. In Kim's bedroom, they found two Dairy Fresh Creamer cups, identical to the ones found at the crime scene, as well as a styrofoam cup that matched one found there as well. They also found a small coin purse that matched the description of cherries, and in the washing machine, they found a single sheet that had some type of stain on it. It looked like it could have been blood. It was theorized that Kim might have used a blanket or a sheet to move the body. They found it interesting that, even though the laundry room was filled with dirty clothes needing to be washed, only this one sheet had been run through the wash. In the dryer, there was a single pair of scrubs and a pair of underwear, possibly the clothes Kim was wearing when she killed Cherry. Kim had two vehicles, a sedan and a small SUV, and they were both taken to be processed. In the sedan, they found soot in the car as well as a hair that matched Cherry's on the headrest of the passenger seat. Kim was arrested on June 24, 2010, but it wasn't actually for the murder of Cherry Walker. She was arrested for a warrant that had been issued for injury to a child. It was from an incident that happened in March when she hit one of her kids in the head with a can of spray paint. This put Kim in jail with a bond set at $500,000. The detectives were able to finish their investigation and not worry about where Kim was, because she was definitely not getting out on bond. It was good news for the detectives. He was not so good for the corrections officers at the jail. Kim was one of the most difficult inmates they had ever had. She yelled at the guards and demanded special food and then would threaten to sue everybody in the jail when she didn't get her way, something that the guards would just roll their eyes at. From jail, Kim started calling a friend named Suzanne Jones Davis and manipulated her into going into her house and getting some of her belongings. They were random mementos that didn't seem to have anything to do with either the child abuse or the capital murder case. It was possibly to soften her up to get her to do other things, which she did. Eventually, she had her go online and change the passwords to her social media account. Then she had her go into her house and change the password on her laptop and call her cell phone and change the password to her voicemail. She had convinced Suzanne that it was to protect her from having her stuff taken away from her. Of course, the police had recordings of all of the phone calls and eventually arrested Suzanne for tampering with evidence. When they interviewed Suzanne, she admitted to helping Kim but didn't know it was illegal. Technically, most of what she did wasn't illegal, but when she connected to Kim's phone, which was in the custody of the police, and changed the password to her voicemail, she tampered with evidence. She told police that Kim had called her on the 21st and told her that her babysitter was killed. She specifically said her babysitter, Cherry Walker, had been found dead on the side of the road. After she got off the phone, Suzanne said she tried to look up Cherry Walker online, but there were no articles using her name. All of the articles she could find said they hadn't identified the body. It turned out that Cherry's identity wasn't announced until the 23rd. Investigators uncovered that Kim had called Cherry relentlessly on June 18th, but after that date, she never made a call to Cherry's phone. It was almost as if she knew that Cherry wouldn't answer for some reason. Kim Cargill was arrested for the capital murder of Cherry Walker on July 14, 2010. At trial, Kim pleaded not guilty. The prosecution went over the timeline of events. How on June 18th, Kim had called multiple people, ranting that Cherry was going to testify, saying it was all Cherry's fault. He described the evidence at the scene, especially the creamer cup that came back positive for Kim's DNA. How the body showed signs of strangulation and how the fire was focused mainly on her neck, 
they called a parade of witnesses up to the stand who all had first-hand experience with Kim's violent reactions to not getting her way. Her neighbor testified that she ran into Kim early the morning of the 19th, and Kim said that she was going to clean her car. The neighbor said that she had never seen Kim up that early on her day off, and nobody had ever experienced her car having been cleaned. Suzanne had testified about Kim calling her on the 21st and telling her that Sherry had been found dead on the side of the road, even though the body wasn't identified until the 23rd. How did Kim know that Sherry was dead if she hadn't killed her? Law enforcement testified about searching her home and the evidence found there. When Kim took the stand in her own defense, she announced that she had in fact set Sherry on fire the night of June 18th, but she claimed to have not killed her. She said that she did pick Cherry up and they went out to eat, and when they left the restaurant, Cherry asked Kim to take her somewhere, a destination that Kim would never name, and when Kim refused, Cherry got upset. As they drove back to her apartment, Cherry started having a seizure. She claimed that they were so close to the Citadel that she pulled into the parking lot, which was empty. But it wasn't. People were actually having a party there that night, and the parking lot was actually full of people. According to Kim, she pulled into the supposedly empty parking lot and ran around to the passenger side of the car. When she opened the door, Cherry fell out and hit her head on the pavement. Then she said that she had left her phone at home, so she ran to Cherry's apartment to see if it was unlocked and she could use a phone inside. It was locked, so then Kim knocked on Marcy's door, but she wasn't home. Kim was a nurse, who should absolutely know what to do while someone is having a seizure. On top of that, Cherry always had her phone on her. She could have used that to call 911. And Kim's ex-husband also lived in the building. She could have tried his apartment. They were only a few blocks away from a hospital, and there were multiple medical clinics around the apartment complex. Supposedly, she went into the building and ran around while Cherry was laying on the ground outside of her vehicle and nobody noticed. On a Friday night in downtown Tyler when people were normally out and about. Kim continued with her story, saying that when she got back to the parking lot, she checked Cherry for a pulse and couldn't find one. Then she rolled Cherry onto her back and began giving her CPR. Kim claimed that when she realized that Cherry was dead, she got her back into the car and then tried to drive down the road to the hospital. Cherry was a bit overweight, which normally would have no relevance to this case, but it is relevant to this specific story that Kim was spinning. Kim was 5'3", about 120 pounds. There was no way that she got Cherry, who weighed over 200 pounds, back into her car by herself. I don't care how strong she was. Even a larger, more muscular person would probably have a pretty hard time completing that task. Lifting weights and lifting dead weight is not the same thing. Kim claimed she drove down to the street and to the hospital, but then she had second thoughts. She believed she'd be blamed for Cherry's murder and instead decided to go out into a country road and burn the body, clearly the next best solution. She even claimed that she didn't originally plan to burn the body, but she conveniently found a can of lighter fluid and a book of matches in her car, so she decided to use it. It turned out that she had in fact bought $5 worth of gas that night. Who puts $5 worth of gas in their car? It was clearly the amount that would fill up a two-gallon gas can. When you search for the average price of gas in Texas in June of 2010, what do you know? It was about $2.60 a gallon. During cross-examination, the prosecutor asked who else Kim had told about Cherry's seizure. Her friends? Her neighbor? Her family? Nobody. She only told this story to her lawyer after she realized the evidence proved she was a killer. Then he brought up the details about her going into the White House Police Department the morning after setting Cherry's body on fire. She pretended she was looking for a lost dog and asked the police if they were busy and fished for information. This was in stark contrast to her claim that she was upset about what had happened with Cherry. There was surveillance video in the police station and she was acting perfectly normal. This must have been around the same time that she went out to wash her car. You know, something else you tend to do when you're upset about lighting a dead body on fire. He also reminded her that, according to the ME and Sherry's doctors, it was highly unlikely that Sherry had a seizure. The only history of seizures that Sherry had ever had were the side effects from a prescribed medication. 
Once it was discovered, she was taken off that medication and hadn't taken it or had a seizure in 10 years. The prosecutor caught her in lie after lie, and though she never would admit to killing Cherry, the jury knew the truth. Kim Cargill was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to death. A death sentence comes with an automatic appeal, which was denied. Kim got new lawyers who got a world-renowned epilepsy doctor to agree that Cherry likely died of a seizure, though he never examined her body, and many of the details in his statement contradict direct evidence. She filed another appeal, which was denied in 2017. She remains on death row in Texas, exactly where a monster like her belongs. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.